Welcome to the Lean Out Your Business podcast, a show dedicated to helping entrepreneurs accelerate business growth and simplify success. I'm your host, Krista Grasso, and I've been working with businesses for more than two decades to help them lean out and optimize what's working while eliminating anything that's not adding value. So if you are ready to get more time back in your day, more profit in your business, and to do business differently, growing and scaling on your terms, let's dive into today's episode. Hello, hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Lean Out Your Business podcast. Today, we are diving into imposter syndrome. And not only are we talking about imposter syndrome, but we're going to be talking about making it your superpower. And so let me introduce today's guest to you. So today I'm joined by Jen Koken, who works with women in power positions who don't feel so powerful anymore. Um, She shatters their self-doubts so they can learn to love themselves, embrace their genius, and own their success. She is recognized by ABC, MSNBC, and TEDx. She's an international peak performance coach, Fortune 500 speaker, imposter syndrome expert. The list of accreditations go on and on. Um, And she is a recovering stand-up comedian, (laughs) and she's hysterical. Um, (laughs) Fortune 500 clients to seven-figure CEOs trust Jen to shake things up with no apologies, no limits, and all the laughs. Jen, welcome. I'm so excited that you are here today. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your journey and why imposter syndrome? Well, um, the real key was, you know, I've been a coach for 23 years and I was a coach for a big company as a side gig while I was in politics for 25 years. I mean, being a coach kept me sane. And then in 2016, I chose to go into business for myself and I was no longer associated or affiliated with this very well-known company. And it was really hard for me to find my voice. It was really hard for me to separate myself from their methodology because of course I wasn't licensed to use it. I had to come up with my own ideas and ways of saying things. In the first three years, I spent a lot of time throwing spaghetti at the wall, figuring stuff out, a lot of honestly following the bro marketing that's out there trying to come up with what everybody else thought they should do. And I wasn't spending time thinking about who I was authentically and what my authentic voice was. When I finally got to that, I said, okay, so it's 2019. I'm going to be out there bold and saying everything that I want to say. And I was just getting my head locked off left and right. So if I wasn't giving a keynote or being on a podcast or being in public, I was under the covers crying, literally. Like, oh my God, questioning and doubting myself. And it was as if all the coaching I had done and all the work I had spent on my, uh, you know, doing on myself was out the window. And I was back, I felt like I was back to square one. Where did my powerful self go? And then I began working with somebody and we unlocked my version of imposter syndrome. Once that happened, it was like the Wizard of Oz where it goes from black and white to color, like, oh. And then I realized how many women out there who get to these powerful positions, the higher they go, the fewer and fewer people look like them. And the more and more they're dealing with imposter syndrome. And I wanted to make sure that women in power positions were living authentic to who they were and not trying to fit in to some mold that somebody else had made for them. And that's why I you know, chose to focus in this area. Yeah. And I feel like so many people probably can resonate with your story. And I'm really curious, do you find that the more powerful somebody's uh, position is, the more they kind of climb the ranks, the more um, they're hesitant to admit to any of their imposter syndrome? Yeah, I think they, they, they either don't recognize that because there's so many nuances. And I know we're going to talk about that during the show, or they don't want to admit it because truly, I mean, Krista, think about it. You don't have a trusted confidant. You know, any woman in the C-suite, you're not going to vent to the people below you. You don't want to vent to your coworkers because things are so competitive. You don't want someone to have something, a one up on you that they know one of your deepest, darkest fears. Maybe you have a partner, maybe you can vent to them, but they're going to make you feel better, but they're not distinguishing where it all comes from. And they certainly haven't been where you are. So when I work with women at that level, they feel like they've got somebody who's been down that road before, who understands where they're coming from, but also will hold their feet to the fire and say, no, 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 
whatever truth in air quotes that you think is about you or your situation or whatever, isn't the truth. It isn't the only way to view things. It's a possible truth. It's a possible viewpoint. So let's look at what else we can create. How else can you show up at work in your powerful self? Yeah, that must be such a powerful um, just partnership for them if they don't feel like they have a lot of places that they could turn for that support and to be kind of vulnerable and share what's really going on. So I love that, which takes me into, I want to dive into what you do specifically. Can can I answer, can I say one thing about that? Sorry to interrupt, but the other piece that's really interesting for me is I love working with brand new CEOs who have no idea the power position they're in. Because they are so used to being part of a team and not being the lead. They don't realize that their relationship with the board is to show up with the plan. Is there any objections? No, this is the direction we're going. So a lot of times I'm having women just align with their power and trust their gut because they are in that position where they are doubting themselves or don't realize how much power they have in the first place. Oh, so much gold in what you just said there. And I think that's true of all women or probably all people, honestly, is that a lot of people probably don't recognize how much they actually have in any given situation. Yep. Absolutely. Absolutely. So let's dive into what you do specifically with imposter syndrome, because one of the things I love so much about it is you take a different angle than a lot of other people take when they talk about imposter syndrome. And I I know you, <laughs> so I have seen the results of what happens when people actually work with you. And it's really different. It's you get people really long lasting results where I don't see that with a lot of the other people. So tell us a little bit about what you do that makes your approach unique. And why does some of the other things that are frequently taught not really work uh, for, the, for the long haul? Yeah. Um, so if you were to go Google how to overcome imposter syndrome, you would likely find anywhere from 1.8 to 2.44 million hits or more. Because whenever I go to give a keynote on this, whenever I go to, um, I didn't do it before this podcast because I was on another call, but I usually will go Google to see what the current trend is, but it's always in a couple million, right? And the reason those don't work, those are tips, tools, and tricks to manage your mind. You cannot manage your mind. Go ahead. Try right now. Try to stop your thoughts. You can't. There's only one time you're going to manage your mind and then it's curtains for everyone. Everybody goes out the same way. And so these coaches are trying to give you all these tips and these mantras and positive thinking and this, you know, I talked to somebody once I was on the phone with them. Okay, well, I'm just going to do these four things. I was like, please stop. Because when you're in the midst of dealing with imposter syndrome, what you're dealing with is an amygdala hijack. So the amygdala is that reptilian part of our brain that governs fight, flight, or freeze, right? The brain's job is to keep the thing it's a brain of alive, which is you. So its job is to constantly and consistently determine the level of threat that you potentially are going to be facing. And it's making sure that you stay safe, all right? So, and your the average human brain has 50 to 60,000 thoughts a day 80 to 85% are negative, 90 to 95% are repetitive. The average human has three to four times more positive things that happen to them. And what do we think about before we go to sleep? But, you know, God, I sent my kid to school with two mismatched socks. Oh my God, why did I say that in the meeting? Oh my God, why didn't that? We think about all the negative stuff because that's the brain doing its thing. Those tips, tools, and tricks are trying to put layers on top. Of all those thoughts, the negativity, it's like lipstick on a pig or icing on a mud pie. It's still a pig. It's still a mud pie. They don't work. And I'm sorry, but if I'm in the middle of being of an amygdala hijack, if I'm in a meeting and uh, somebody, we're having a discussion and maybe I haven't read the brief beforehand, maybe I uh, didn't do my homework before the meeting, or maybe I'm just having a bad day and wasn't paying attention because I'm going over a fight I had with a kid or a partner or a friend or whatever. And someone asked me a question. I don't have an answer. In that moment, amygdala hijack. Oh my God, what am I going to do? What am I going to say? And then you've got to figure out how to navigate that. In that moment, I'm sorry, a positive mantra, doing affirmations to yourself. So even, and I quote her work all the time, Dr. Valerie Young, who wrote, wrote the seminal book, 
an imposter syndrome and I take the archetypes from her book, her stance is stop thinking like an imposter. And I say to her and everybody else, um, seriously, it doesn't work. So stop doing it. Now, how is what I do different? Twofold. One, we make it your superpower. Instead of trying to overcome it and defend it, we're going to figure out a way to embrace it because you know what? Whatever that piece is, and we'll talk about those archetypes, it's gotten you to where you are. So how do we tap into that? Number two, I have found in working with my clients, there's always a source. There's a moment when you were a kiddo, little, not dramatic, not traumatic, where something happened and the brain had an experience, the, like the brain and the body had an experience it did not want, embarrassment, um, frustration, uh, shame is a lot of it, guilt. You don't want to experience that again. So I'm going to figure out a strategy to avoid that. So I had a client who, wonderful lady, had been in her company for 26 years in the C-suite. She was ready to leave. Used to love her boss, hated her boss. Used to love working with people, didn't like it anymore. Couldn't figure out how come, because she used to be so, like, so happy in her job. We actually figured out when she was nine, she brought a C home on a test. And her dad said, what's up with the C? She said, I don't know, it's average. Give me 1,500 words on average. Boom embarrassed, shame, guilty, don't want to experience that again. I'm going to get everything perfect. And he'll never talk to me that way again. So her perfectionism kicked in and drove her very well into the C-suite. People relied on her to get across the T's and dot the I's. But when it came to in her personal relationships, it wasn't very fulfilling for her. When we get to that source, we're able to unlock that brain pattern and literally, Kristen, three sessions, bam, people are off to the races. We unlock it, create a new brain pattern, blah, blah, blah. And we're done and done and one, one and done, one and done, done and one. <laughs> Both work. Because <laughs> I think the thing is what you do actually does genuinely work. And I really love that. And I love the flip of making it your superpower. And I think so often we find things that are wrong with us oh my God. and we try to fix them and we try to overcome them and we try to do all these things and we are who we are. So why not embrace that part of you and learn how to leverage it to actually be more successful? And I love that that's the take that you, um, you approach it with. So we do, we, we have our light side and our shadow side, right? And, and we've got to learn to love the dark as well as the light. As Rilke, Reiner Maria Rilke said, when, you know, once upon a time, it was on the box, box of a celestial seasonings tea box, but I'll never forget it. We have to learn to love the questions like un, like locked doors and rooms of a home that we have no key to get into. We've got to learn to embrace that, to love those locked doors until one day we'll find the key in our hand and open it. I just give people the key to open that and embrace that part of themselves they've been resisting. So let's dive in okay. and talk about the archetypes themselves and the five types of imposter syndrome so listeners can start to think through and maybe identify where they have some of the characteristics. Yep. So why don't we start with the perfectionist since you mentioned that? Yeah. So he, people who are think of themselves as perfectionists are people who do not delegate, who micromanage people who stress out all the time over their whether their work is good enough. Should you launch that website? Should you launch that new idea? Well, I'm not going to get to it yet because I've got to do one more thing. They also set insanely high marks for themselves. And when they don't meet the mark, they, they beat themselves up for a really long time. But they also do that with other people. They have insanely high bars for other people to meet, whether it's in your dating life, your work life, your personal life. And if people don't meet them, you are upset for days. Yeah, I feel like most entrepreneurs probably have a lot of the perfectionist uh, tendencies. <laughs> yeah, well, there's the thing, too, is that nobody fits into one archetype cleanly. Mm -hmm. As we're going through these, people will, well, yeah, I delegate, but I do micromanage. Or I don't expect perfectionism in other people, but I do for me. And so as we're going through the five archetypes, you'll hear yourself in different situations mm -hmm. tapping into different aspects of imposter syndrome. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. So let's dive into the next one and natural genius. Yeah. So this is one I really identified with when I first came across uh, Dr. Young's book, because things always came naturally to me. 
you know, it was easy for me in school. I skipped a grade. I graduated high school at 16. I went to college at 17. Never really had to apply myself. And I got decent grades. So I definitely wasn't the perfectionist. I wasn't expecting the 4.0. But things were so easy for me. But here's the kicker about the natural genius. Things are so easy that when the, when you can't see your way clear to go from point A to point B, when you don't see a clear path, you don't do it because you think you can't because things always came easy. Or if you try something and it's hard, you'll quit, which is what I used to do mostly in my personal life, like learning how to West Coast swing or being part of a, you know, a volunteer choir, things like that. Well, if it wasn't perfect, I didn't want to do it. So you have perfectionist and natural genius. So that's your natural genius. How about the individualist or soloist? Oh yeah, I love this one because whenever I go out to speak, I'm always like, how how many of you love helping people? If you could, you'd lend someone a hand. Every hand goes up. How many of you love asking for help? To a T, no hands go up. I was in a presentation last two years ago now, pre-pandemic, but two years ago now, um, where I asked that question, how many of you love, you know, helping people? Every hand in the room went up. How many of you love asking for the help? Out of 300 women, one woman's hand went up. And I looked at her, I said, what are you doing this weekend? She goes, I'm moving. I go, well, you should talk to people because you have 299 people who would love to help you if they could. But that's the key with the soloist. You don't like asking for help. You think it shows you're weak. If you do, you, you know, you just have to do everything on your own. And a key here is you feel like you can't rely on people. I'll give you an example from a client. 12 years old, walking to get ice cream after school. They get with some girlfriends. They get to the store. Two of the girls didn't have money. She says, I'll pay. The fourth girl says, there she goes again, taking care of everybody. Bam. I'm going to do it on my own. Never going to offer anybody help. Shh. Straight in an arrow, you know, very direct in her communication. Doesn't mince words. Rose up to right below the sea level at one company. She couldn't rise any further because of this tendency to do things alone. I did work with her. Bam. CFO at another company. I was able to really create team. That's great. Yeah. And I, re I resonate with a lot of that. It's, I actually like to work in a team environment. I love to be collaborative and I will as much as possible, but it's really hard for me to ask for help. Sometimes I am willing to help anybody, anytime you need anything, I'll hop on the phone with you, but I'm very reluctant to usually ask somebody to help me. <laughs> yeah. Well, so. what do you make it mean? That you don't like what's right there when you don't want to ask for help what's the thought what's the stop for me it's always i don't want to inconvenience somebody mm -hmm. and i can figure it out on my own if i really need to i don't want to i don't want to take their time i don't want to put them out and so that tends to be my um my natural tendency i've learned to push through that and actually ask for help over the years yeah but my natural tendency is not to Okay, I'll tell you, it's not a natural tendency because you weren't born not asking for help. You screamed out of your mother's womb. You yelled until you got a bottle. You yelled until your diaper was changed. You yelled until somebody, you know, uh, fed you. You asked and asked and asked. No, can I have that? 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 No, until you couldn't. So something happened when you were really young where you probably got embarrassed when you asked for help and you were told whatever you were told in that moment, you're like, all right, that's it. I guarantee you, I guarantee you, I won't make you do it on air right now, but I guarantee you that's the thing. You hear this guys? There's some Krista coaching going on right now. <laughs> I can't help it. It's in my blood. I can't help it. <laughs> All right. So let's move on to the expert. Oh, well, how many degrees do you have? How much more information do you need to know before you post that blog post? How much more do you need to know about everything before you agree to give that keynote? How about uh, Margaret Cho, who used to be head of the World Health Organization, who hated that people called her an expert in the first place? You're supposed to be an expert. You're head of the World Health Organization. We expect that from you. Thank you. Good night. Seriously, I had a client who really, really well known in the legal profession for her niche, and she was an expert. And every time she was asked to keynote or be on a panel, her palms would sweat. She'd throw up beforehand because, again, it was a stuck pattern from when she was a little kid. And it actually had nothing to do with her. It's when somebody else, when she was little, she used to be a competitive dancer. 
And she saw another kid have a meltdown. And she's like, I'm never going to have a meltdown like that. I don't want to be in the spotlight like that. I'll have a meltdown. And so she vowed never to be in the spotlight. So she was always, always, always battling with herself. But people continue to call on her to give expert testimony and be an expert speaker all the time. Fascinating. And I see this one with entrepreneurs quite a bit. <laughs> Yeah. A lot, a lot with some of my clients as yeah, well. And, and the key I think is, especially with entrepreneurs, because you feel like, all right, but I'm, I'm, um, I'm a coach in whatever space, right? Is anybody going to buy my stuff? Because the coaching, even, even with the number of coaches that are out there, the space is not saturated. Look, we have a diet industry that's a billions and billions and billions of dollar diet industry because, well, I tried the keto and then I tried the grapefruit and then I tried the bone broth diet. And then I tried the toenail diet. And then I tried the blah, 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 and blah, blah, blah. Look here, I'll give you the clue. Eat less, exercise more. Knowledge, knowledge makes no difference at all. Only thing that makes difference ever makes a difference ever is action. So if you're an entrepreneur and you're listening to this and you've been waiting to learn more and know more, forget it, forget about it. Take the action, pull the trigger, launch your product. You know what? You can always tweak it. Oh, there's the new Coke. Well, that lasted a hot minute. And they're like, yeah, we're going to retire it back to the old Coke. Now no one even remembers new Coke versus old Coke because it was such a dismal disaster. If Coke can mess up publicly in that manner, so can you. Yeah, it's true. And I do, I see this so often. It's like, well, I want to finish this course first and then I'm going to, or well, I want to see this first and then I'm going to. And it's always building that thing that they think they need for somebody to see them as credible when they're so deeply knowledgeable already. They don't need the degree or the course or the certification. <laughs> no, you know, the one person that has to know them as credible? Themselves, I'm going to guess. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Look, I suffer from that too, from time to time. You know, I was uh, working with my business coach, uh, you know, last week and thinking about some new product, uh, my intuitive business coach and thinking about something new. And I'm like, I don't know, do I need to like enter this person's program or do I need to just get that I know what I'm doing and just work the system I already have? She was like, uh, I think you already answered it. Like, okay. Yeah. And which also Side note, you are one of my business coaches and you've said the same damn thing to me. So <laughs> I wasn't going to say that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's move into number five. So superwoman da -da. or superman or super yeah. person. <laughs> superman, superwoman. You get your own self of self-worth by the amount of hours that you work. You're not doing anyone any favors by sleeping under your desk, by working 14 hours, by working 16 hours. You're not because you're not feeding yourself. You equate success with the number of hours of, that you work, which actually goes completely against the lean out method and what you do. Because no, you don't want to work more hours doing the crap that you don't like doing or filling your day with things. You want to be in your zone of genius. You want to be working in the arena where you're passionate, where the time passes, where you're in the zone, where you're in that state of flow. Because when we're in a state of flow, then we're more creative. We actually have three times more creative days when we're in the, after being in the state of flow. So Superman or woman, you know who you are. You're the people who like to swoop in and save the day too. And by the way, when you try to swoop in and save the day, you know what you're going to always create around you? Problems. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, days to be saved. Yeah. <laughs> you think of yourself as the one, I was actually working with a client who felt like she had to solve everything. And I was like, why do you keep setting it up that way? What if you allowed people to, what if you empowered them to make their own mistakes? Yeah. But then I'm like, no, no, you don't have to work that hard. You want to work smarter, work leaner, and you definitely don't have to swoop in and save the day. So as people are listening, I'm sure they're probably hearing bits and pieces of each of these and saying, mm, yeah, I definitely do that. Or I, you know, I don't do that, but I do this. Yeah. <laughs> and so what would be your advice? What's something that somebody could do as an actionable um, takeaway to start to really think about this? I would take my quiz, um, jencokenquiz.com, really simple. That will do a couple of things. That will a you answer 20 questions and you'll see within the scoring, how you don't have, you know, you might have a higher score in one area than the other, but there's four or five questions within each of the archetypes 
and notice the questions you score highest on and start to notice what's giving you that, that clue or that cue. When you take that quiz, you're going to get a follow-up email from me with a link to a free webinar that will take you through the whole um, system and approach of imposter syndrome so that you can take notes. There's a worksheet, write it down. And also, oh, by the way, you get a free 30 minute coaching call with me to go over your results and talk about potentially next steps. If it's working with me, great. If it's not, you want to keep being an imposter. Awesome. No worries. You can go either way. Yeah. And the quiz is excellent. Um, I really enjoy the quiz. It's super simple. It's super straightforward, but I feel like it really does make you think. I'm looking at the questions and I'm like, huh, actually yeah. where, where would I write on this? And so I think it's, I think it's an excellent quiz. I Thank really you. enjoy it. Thank you. Thank so, you. thank you. All right. So I have to ask you the question that okay. I ask everybody. Um, so how do you work smarter, not harder in your business and keep things lean? Okay. You know, I hired you, which was step number one. I'm not kidding. I mean, literally that was a game changer for me. I think we worked together last December where we spent a day and really went through everything. And you, you like helped me see what the roadmap was and the things I could cut out and oh, by the way, take Fridays off and oh, by the way, uh, you know, stop working at 5 PM and oh, by the way, only coach clients between one and five. You have that amazing system that makes me focus for those 90 days on the one thing. And the other piece I did was I delegated things out that I had no business doing that were important to run my business, but I didn't need to be doing like uh, dealing with my calendar. So I hired a VA to deal with my calendar and then we had to train him, you know? So I now have a team around me, which is really distinct and unique for me. And so I can spend time in my zone of genius and not my zone of confidence, but literally hands down, Krista, it was a game changer for me working with you and the... um the quarterly, what do you call them? The workbooks, the notebooks, the planner, the planner. Thank you. I the couldn't planner, yeah. the quarterly <laughs> planner. Yeah. Super, super helpful. And you know, and I just keep focusing on what's the one thing, what's the one thing and realizing I don't need to, you know, I have so much content. I don't need to create more. I do two things. I coach people one-on-one -on -one, or you can be in my group, one of my group programs. What do you want? I don't need to create anything more. That's it. You know? Yeah. And I just have to say, I love watching you just take action and get things done and really commit to staying focused on your zone of genius, because I think it's not enough to just identify it. A lot of people are like, I know what my zone of genius is, but when you look at what they spend their time doing, they're not spending most of their time in their zone of genius. Yeah. And you just have so committed to really building that amazing rock star team around you so that you can do what you do best. They can do what they do best. And you've just got this really amazing ecosystem for success in your business. And I absolutely love that about you. Thank <laughs> so, you. And I would tell you, it it had, was a headspace changer for me. Literally, my financial advisor left me a message at 8.30 this morning. I called him right back. He's like, where are we at with the paperwork to set up the retirement account? I go, I don't know. My team has it handled. You know, my business manager is talking with my accountant and my uh, bookkeeper and they're setting it up. Okay, well, who do I have to nudge? I'm like, this person. Okay, good. That was it. Because I don't have space in my head for all that, you know, and it was stressing me the F out to be working so hard. And you know this, which is I was diagnosed with breast cancer last August, right after having a moment for myself in July of literally at a breakdown on my balcony, exhausted, crying. I can't work this hard anymore. I can't do all this anymore. I need a break. And bam, cancer stepped in. Thankfully, I'm cancer free. But it really, really trained me on saying no, which I think is also a hard thing for people to say. No, thank you is a whole and complete sentence. Yeah, it is. And I love also how much you've prioritized your health and well-being and just I think so many of the changes that you've made in general, it's I just I feel like you have a super rich and passion filled life. And that's exactly what we want. It's exactly. amazing. You're doing the work you love. You have a life that you love. Like you have health, <laughs> like your health is in in great place. It's just amazing all around. Well, thank so you. thank you. Thank yay, you. you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so let's tell people more about what you've got coming up. So if people are, you know, curious to learn more, obviously you shared the quiz, but where else can people find you and what's going on in your world? Yeah. I think the easiest place for people to find me is on my website, www.jenkoken.com. 
Um, it has a drop down for coaching in there. You can see I do this great uh, challenge periodically called the Awaken Your Greatness Challenge that's going on right now. I have this amazing group program called the Dream Accelerator Academy, which in 12 weeks takes your dream off the back shelf, puts it into a plan, and you get six weeks of accountability. It also goes over imposter syndrome, talks about my one-on-one -on -one coaching and my corporate coaching as well. That is the easiest place, jenkoken.com, or people can always email me, jen at jenkoken.com. We try to keep things streamlined, jenkokenquiz.com, jenkoken.com, jen at jenkoken.com. So the thing to remember is Jen Koken. <laughs> if you've got it. that, you can find all the places you and you can it. also look at the show notes because you you'll see yeah. everything down below. Yep. Exactly. <laughs> all right, Jen. Well, thank you so much. It's been amazing, incredible. So everyone, I hope you're really taking some time to reflect on this and think where might imposter syndrome be coming up for you and how can you take that and actually turn it into your superpower? Absolutely. So Jen, thanks so much. And uh, everyone, we will talk with you next week. Thank you for joining me for another episode of the Lean Out Your Business podcast. I hope you got a lot of value and actionable insights from today's show and would love if you take a moment to leave us a review. If you have any questions on today's episode or on how to lean out your business, join us over in our private Facebook community where every week we do live training and Q&A and I'd love to have you be part of the conversation. Head to leanoutmethod.com slash group to join us. And before you go, be sure to subscribe to the show so you're the first to know when we release a new episode. We'll see you next week.